This is the Quantum Biology Podcast, where we break down the practical health applications of this emerging science, starting with healthy light habits and going wherever the quantum superhighway takes us. In this episode, we chat with quantum cardiologist, Dr. Michael Twyman, about preventative heart health and why he switched from helping people recover from heart attacks to helping them avoid them in the first place. Dr. Twyman shares his experience leaving establishment medicine and embracing an approach that combines the best of traditional training with the insights of a quantum biologic practitioner. He also tells us the absolute non-negotiable number one thing we all need to do to reduce our chances of a major cardiac incident. And it's probably not what you think. This conversation is a really good one for newcomers to the idea of quantum and circadian biology and is highly recommended for anyone with a history of heart disease in their family. Enjoy. All right. Welcome, Dr. Twyman. It is wonderful to see you again. Uh, We did a big, long interview a couple of years ago, so I'm excited to catch up and see where everything is at now. Yeah. Thank you for round two. Awesome. Awesome. So, Dr. Twyman, I love how you talk about um, your journey from being a very traditional cardiologist to being uh, a quantum cardiologist, and you talk about leaving the matrix. Could you tell us that story? Sure. I mean, it's a great movie from 1999. I think <laughs> there's so many things in that movie that just you know made it crystal clear, like, you know, are you going to take the red pill or the blue pill? And at one point, I had to decide to take the red pill just to leave that traditional world of medicine. I still have it in my back pocket that I can use those skills when needed, but I've developed some other skills along the way. So I completed my conventional cardiovascular training back in 2012 and was an invasive cardiologist for many years. I treated many heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, abnormal heart rhythms, such as atrial fibrillation, and took care of some really sick people in the hospital for many years. But I really was interested in the prevention side of things. And you really have to kind of step outside the matrix because conventional medicine is really, especially in cardiology, it's about pills and procedures. It's fixing very, very broken people and trying to get them along their way. So I kind of thought about more kind of like the Humpty Dumpty analogy. It's like, we're waiting for these people to fall. Why don't we just wait and fix them at the, you know, 10 years before they fell off the wall type of analogy. So when I got in my training, I was in a, you know, conventional practice for a few years, um, but had a lot of interest in advanced lipid testing and started learning more about things outside of my traditional training. And so initially go down kind of the functional medicine route. So, you know, it's more about nutrition. So I was talking to patients about paleo diets and, you know, exercise and all the things that, you know, you know, are probably better than conventional, but weren't getting people all the right results all the time. It's still tools that I use, but sometimes Functional medicine isn't the thing that's going to cure people, you know, because it's deeper. It's this quantum level that we've been speaking about on, you know, our previous podcasts and, you know, uh, interviews. You know, it's really about how your mitochondria interact with the world. And when I realized that, like, oh, the heart is heavily dense in mitochondria, and I don't know what really fixes mitochondria, then maybe I don't really know everything about cardiology that I need to help my patients get better. So that's really taking the red pill and unplugging from the matrix is when you kind of go through conventional medicine, functional medicine, and then find quantum medicine. Right. Yeah. So the quantum medicine really is like the next frontier and it's answering questions. So functional medicine started to answer some of them and now, but now we've hit a wall, especially as our environment is changing so much. Um, What I'm hearing from practitioners is that functional approaches that used to work quite well, maybe 10 years ago, are not having the same effect in terms of helping their clients and patients recover now. Yeah, I would definitely tend to agree with that. I mean, and, you know, I don't like to kind of pigeonhole myself into saying that, you know, I'm one type of, you know, practitioner. Mm Yeah. Yes, I'm board certified in cardiology. I just recertified. So I still know all the same things that my conventional colleagues know. And sometimes that is the best tools to use. So you don't want to throw them away, but it also really helped me kind of understand that like, if you don't fix things earlier, I know I can just forecast, I can see the path these patients are heading. So it was very useful training, but you want to kind of use the best of both worlds. And so, you know, a lot of the things in the quantum world, they're free, but it's mostly about education. You just have to understand how to implement these things. Yes, absolutely. And that's a great point on the practitioner front. It's like, 
I never want anyone to feel like what they already know is no longer useful. It's all very useful. We need everything we need like for what we're up against. We need all the tools in the toolbox and all of the paradigms coming together. So that's a really good point. But yes, to your second point, there isn't as much traction around a quantum approach to health, because as you said, so much of it is just changing our habits and understanding certain choices that we're making and how they're impacting us. And there's, yeah, there's nothing really to sell or take (laughs) at that level. I mean, yeah, there are some, you know, gear, you know, different grounding shoes or different red light panels. And we can talk about those things if people are interested, but the the basics are free. I mean, but sometimes when this world is introduced, you just almost can't believe that it's possible that it's this simple. So I usually just challenge people like, just do one of these things. Like my number one thing is always see the morning sunrise, like just wherever you're in the world, be outside for five, 10 minutes and get that light in your eyes. You don't even have to understand what it's doing to you. Just do it as part of the habit and build that habit. And tell me in a few days, weeks, hey, I'm starting to sleep better. I have more you know, brain energy. You know, I'm you know, thinking more clearly. You'll notice something different. And then you can go deeper into like, why does that work? Okay. So tell us why. Yeah. I mean, it's all about your circadian rhythms. I mean, it's your 24-hour cycles. I, I love saying the German word zeitgeber. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's the time giver. The main one is the light that enters your eyes. And so for anybody watching the video, I always am wearing the kind of the crazy biohacker glasses when I'm on these things, because one, I want to demonstrate to people like I do the same things that I'm teaching my patients. Like I'm not going to tell you to wear the glasses or go out and see the sunrise if I don't personally do these type of things. So lead by example, but your eyes are exquisitely sensitive to different wavelengths of light. The sun always has the right recipe of light when you're outside. So in the morning time, when that light hits your eyes, it activates this supercosmic nucleus after it hits this melanopsin receptor. The melanopsin receptor, don't worry if you don't know how to spell it or understand melanopsin at this point, basically a blue light detector in your eye. And when that blue light detector senses those photons of light, it tells the front part of the brain, it is daytime. You start making more cortisol and all your hormones that make you feel better. You know, your body's getting ready to go hunt for the day. And then the reverse happens at night when the sun would be setting the little blue light detector and I realizes no more photons of light that are daytime. It must be nighttime. And so cortisol, all the hormones that keep you alert, they start dropping. And the hormones that help you optimize your sleep, such as melatonin, start to rise. But you need that darkness for melatonin to be released and stay released, essentially. So if you're being exposed to a lot of bright light at nighttime from your technology, you're basically tricking the brain into thinking that it's still noontime and you're going to have to stay alert. You're not going to be as optimally ready to go to sleep. So start winding down your technology at night and likely invest in a pair of nice blue blocking glasses. You know, if you're kind of the full on biohacker, then your house can look like the, you know, the submarine like mine does where you have a bunch of different red light bulbs, but maybe you're not ready for that. So just buy the glasses and just see how it works for you. Right. Yes, we were um, up at our cottage a couple of weeks ago. We took the dog for a walk and came back and like the whole thing is glowing red. So yeah. my daughter always jokes that she'll she'll never get lost coming home because she yes. could always just look for the house that glows red. Um, okay, so let's let's take this a little further. Um, because when I first came to to all of this, the only thing you know I understood about circadian rhythms because I led a life that included a lot of jet lag. So my understanding of circadian rhythms was like how you just explained it. I didn't know the details of it, but it was sort of like my sleep wake cycles. And I knew that I should spend a lot of time outside in a new time zone to get on that time. And that was the only time I really thought about light. So how does regulating our circadian rhythms by having a a dim or red house at night and going outside a lot during the day, how does that help our heart health? Excellent question is that, you know, all your organs are on different cycles uh, and, you know, your heart rate is normally going to be dropping as you're sleeping, you know, and there's just different daily rhythms that your heart is doing. But think in ways of your mitochondria as being engines, those engines need to be repaired. When do they repair? They repair when you're sleeping. And so getting the proper light signals in your eye and on your skin throughout the day gets the body ready to repair those engines at night. And since your heart is 
heavily dense with mitochondria. And I've seen you know, numbers between three to 5,000 mitochondria per heart cell. You want to do everything possible to allow those engines to make you peak energy the next day because heart failure comes in two main flavors, systolic and diastolic heart failure. Systolic heart failure is when the heart does not squeeze very well. You have you know, a low ejection fraction. You know, every time the heart squeezes, less blood comes out than it should. But a more common and a little bit more difficult to treat type of heart failure is diastolic heart failure. And that's when the heart is relaxing, when the blood is sucking blood into it from the lungs. It takes a lot more energy for the heart to relax than it does to squeeze. And so often on an echocardiogram, an ultrasound of your heart, you can start seeing this diastolic dysfunction many weeks, months, years before the person actually starts having symptoms. So I always mm. back it up to like, what could you do to support the heart to relax better? Do something that supports the mitochondria and that's back to the sleep better. And that's back to the, get the proper light signals. Okay. This is so interesting. So getting the proper light signals means we get quality sleep, which means our mitochondria is able to repair itself and work better. And our heart is mostly made up of mitochondria. A lot of mitochondria, that... yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is so interesting to me because I think when people think about, oh, what should I do that would be good for my heart health? It's like, don't eat bacon, go running. <laughs> you know? yeah. I, yeah. I don't even know if people connect. I certainly didn't connect quality sleep. And then in to get quality sleep, we have to look at the light picture. Correct. And you know, I will definitely get into people's nutrition and exercise habits, <laughs> but I want to tell them first, like, you have to sleep better if you're not already. Because if you don't mind your mitochondria at night, it does not matter almost what you do the next day. You can eat perfectly clean fuel food all day long. You can exercise like a beast. If you beat yourself up so much, but don't recover, you're just going to wear out faster. So you have to work on the sleep first. And even the conventional cardiology world understands this, is that like a lot of heart rhythm issues, such as atrial fibrillation, it's often associated with obstructive sleep apnea, high blood pressure, often associated with sleep apnea, congestive heart failure associated with sleep apnea. So if your bed partner snores, stops breathing, or you wake up the next day with dry mouth, headache, feel like you didn't get any rest and you feel like you're going to have to take a nap before noon, it's very plausible you have sleep apnea. There's now at home, you know, sleep studies that you can get done. You know, it looks like a little watch you wear in your own bed and it gives you a report the next day if you have sleep apnea. If you have sleep apnea, get it treated, sleep better, a lot of your, quote, medical conditions start to melt away. It's so interesting. So when you, um, you talk about having sort of four pillars of heart health, would quality sleep then be one of them? Yes, but it's something I probably should almost have where it's like there's three pillars and there's a major pillar and that's the sleep one. Okay. So the, the four pillars of optimal health, and there's probably more, but like I, I just try to make it easy for people because like mm -hmm. if I tell you, you gotta do all these things on day one, like it's gonna overwhelm people. Mm -hmm. So it's just like four pillars. Yes, we will definitely talk about nutrition. That's a pillar. You know, exercise is a pillar. But the ones that people tend to not think about as much is their stress management, because you're gonna be stressed mentally. You're going to be stressed physically. How do you recover from that? That is really the key. It's not the stressor that's the problem. It's your recovery from it. And then the fourth pillar, which is probably more important than all the other three, it's really high quality sleep because that's where the magic happens with the mitochondria getting repaired. The autophagy and apoptosis happen. You know, if you don't do those processes, it's like having worn out engines for years on end. You're not going to go 200 miles an hour when you're putting in all this healthy food and trying to sprint in the gym. Hmm. I just find this so fascinating as it's, it's just, I mean, I've been, you know, interviewing you and lots of other people for so many years. And I still, every time I'm like, oh, you know, like thinking about quality sleep as a heart attack prevention strategy, that mm -hmm. is such an important, like, it's just so key. And I really, I don't think we think about it any, and I'm thinking of people in my life who I've, who I've lost I'm thinking of one person in particular who was the husband of a friend of mine um, and they, you know, they had kids and he was not, he was in his fifties and his, he died of heart failure and uh, he led an extremely sleep deprived life, like extremely. 
it's something that, you know, I think they're getting more aware of it now, but yeah, when I was going through my medical training, you know, I was often on call in the ICU every third night, sleeping in the hospital, you know, working 36 hour shifts with no sleep. Yeah. You go home, you sleep for seven, eight hours, wake up and go do it again for 12 hours, go home, do it for 12 hours. And then you go on for 36 hours. And so that was just the way you were, you know, conditioned. And, you know, it's somewhat of, it's kind of like a camaraderie thing. It's like all your colleagues are doing it. So you're like, well, why can't I do it? And you just kind of push yourself through it through force of will. But in the back of your head, you know, like this cannot be necessarily good for me. And when you're in your twenties, well, your hydroplasmy rate of your mitochondria isn't as bad. So you can kind of get away with it a little bit, but that is slightly one of the reasons I stepped away from doing that type of work in the hospitals is like, I did not want to break down earlier than I you know, planned to. You know, I have a great grandmother who made it to 106. I'm going to try to beat a record. If I'm not sleeping well, because I'm up in the middle of the night taking care of heart attacks, I am not going to make my health goals. And so sleep became such a priority that I basically had to create a new medical paradigm, new practice to be able to get that done. You know, sleep is my number one health goal, essentially. It's like I don't, you know, mess with it. I mean, it's extremely rare that I'm not in bed at the, almost the same time. And I get up four or 5 a.m., no matter where I'm at in the world, you know, it's extremely rare that I don't hit those, those time marks. You know, the, the trick almost is that you have to think of sleep is not when you end your day. You have to think of sleep is when you begin your day. When you put your head down on the pillow is when you start your day, you charge up your mitochondria for whatever, seven, half, eight hours. And then when you wake up, you are fully charged up to run out there and go do the things you need to do in the day, dissipate that energy. And then you start over. So that is kind of the mind trick you can sometimes play to think like it's that important. Sleep has to be the first thing. Absolutely. And so with anybody who has any kind of history of heart disease in their family, you know, you always, I always have people, you know, my own husband who is a patient of yours, he came and did all the tests, got it all checked out because he has a history of heart disease in the family. And I think of all of the things that people focus on, mostly food, um, in terms of being like, oh, I have to be careful. Like my father died or my grandfather died or whatever. And it's like going to bed early <laughs> is by far the most important way to manage that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Start with that first. And then yes, yeah. nutrition is important. I won't tell people it's not, but to be just hyper focused on nutrition and ignore the sleep, that's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Like you're not going to get the results that you really want. Okay. So I'm glad we spent some time on that point because I do think it's really important. And for anybody listening, please, the sleep, please, please, please. My daughter has reached an age where she started, she's starting to socialize in the evenings. And so we always drop her off and she has, she has to Uber home because we're like, sorry, we're in bed. And she came home the other night. She's like, mom, how's that my friend's house? She's like, her parents stay up till like 1230, one o'clock in the morning. She's like, did you know people do that? Like <laughs> she's so used to <laughs> us <laughs> going to bed at like nine or nine 30. Right. <laughs> she was shocked. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I said, yeah, it's pretty normal. Like we grew up, you know, the 11 o'clock news came on, you'd watch a show from 10 to 11, and then people would watch the 11 o'clock news, you'd be up in front of a screen and, you know, yeah, go to bed. And I guess you only get six or seven hours of sleep. Um, mm. So yeah, it's, it's, a, I think, a huge sort of mind shift to get to, to a place where that kind of lifestyle is tantamount to smoking <laughs> in yes, terms I mean, of junk junk red is the equivalent to smoking like i you know can barely stand to go into a you know, brightly lit department store you know without having the glass on i feel like you know, i'm gonna have a seizure or something like that like i can't believe that other people aren't wearing glasses in these really horribly lit you know environments so i think yeah someday junk light's going to be right up there with smoking we'll be like oh i can't believe we used to have these kind of lightings <laughs> it's true and that's another mind shift too is that like if you know, I say to somebody that, oh, it turns out margarine's bad for you. People can sort of mentally recategorize, oh, I'll take margarine out of the health food category and put it in the junk food category. Yeah. But with light, people didn't even, we don't even think about it in terms of categories, right? Like, it's just light. Like, what are you talking about? If I, if I need to see, I'll turn on a light, <laughs> even if it's dark outside, what's the difference? So could you talk a little bit about that? And then we'll, we'll segue into, um, into red light therapy and that type of light. Sure. And then I think it's sometimes it's the, you know, you don't know what you don't know and you don't feel what you've never felt before is that, you know, yeah, I definitely had those, those times in my life where, you know, 
11, 30, midnight was kind of the normal bedtime. And this wasn't just in college. This was much later. And then I literally, when I was in the military, I'd wake up 20 minutes before I had to be at the office seeing patients. You know, I'd throw on my uniform, eat a granola bar and some soda in the car on the way to work, run in there and just start seeing patients. And that was just how it was for a few years. And you operated at what you thought was a high level. And then you really get into this light environment. And, you know, I, you know, you talked about jet lag earlier. That's how I got into this. It's like I was flying over to Asia and I was like, I bet the jet lag is going to be really bad going there from St. Louis. So I better like figure out what I'm going to do for my plan to get there. And I just saw some website talking about these glasses and I bought them warm and like the jet lag was there, but it wasn't as bad. I was like, I have no idea how that worked. That was awesome. And now I got to go read about that after I, you know this trip. And now, you know, a couple of years later, this is, this is how my entire life. I built my practice around, you know, controlling my light environments. But once I started doing that, then, you know, my brain just kicked into another level. Like, you know, you're like the six gear on a stick shift. You know, people still have stick shifts. I do. It's in my car. <laughs> nobody can steal my car because nobody can drive. Me. But, you know, but when your brain gets in that six gear, you're like, oh, I got this other level. That's just your mitochondria in your brain firing on all cylinders. And if you don't get your light signal right, you're, you know, basically the mitochondria kind of wind down and you're not making as much energy. You'll still function, but you'll just be like, I know I'm missing something. And you will not know what you're missing until you can get to that to that level. Yeah, it's really true. And I think what you said earlier is perfect, right? It's like, just try it. Because the the difference is astounding. And even like a few years, you know, a few years into it, I knew I wasn't getting enough morning light because I would just sort of, you know, I'd go out and get some and then rush into my day. So my solution, because I need... I'm not good at like self-structured habits. So we got a puppy (laughs) and then I'm like, well, the puppy has to go out. So I'll have to go out. And so now I'm out for 45 minutes in the morning instead of five or 10. Mm -hmm. And I feel so different. It's amazing. That morning sunlight is unbelievable. Like I have more energy all day long. Um, I'm less hungry. I didn't sleep better. And I was doing pretty well. Like I was you know, it's, it's just amazing. Yeah. And the, the, there's also kind of like a converse to that is that, you know, you might be in a place in the wintertime where you don't get a lot of sun, you know, or it just doesn't, you know, work in your convenient schedule, but you still have to get bright light in the morning time. But this is where sometimes the sun runs come in, you know, head down to Mexico for, you know, a few days, kind of recharge up the system and then come back to where you're at. But while I can't yeah. say that there's truly a diagnosable disease called this, I really have experienced it and family friends I've you know, been with in Mexico have experienced too. There really is something that feels like acute sun withdrawal. Like if you've been outside mm. for like 12 hours a day and then you come back and you're in front of artificial light and you don't get that proper sun exposure, you feel way off. You just, you can't even explain like, why do I feel this way? And that's just going to be your baseline. When you get all the proper sun, you go back to that more optimal sensation. Right. And that's how we're meant to feel right? Like we've become so used to feeling like moderately crappy that it seems amazing that we're actually meant to feel good. For sure. Yeah. And being outside for a large portion of the day, especially in the morning is just such an easy way to get back to that. Okay. So we talked uh, a little bit about blue blockers. So I just want to cover that for an extra minute um, because you talked about wearing them uh, we talked about wearing them at night and then you talked about wearing them in the day. So could you just explain the difference um, among blue blockers? Because I don't want anyone to come away from this, like putting dark orange glasses on during the day or putting light yellow ones at night. Like there's there's a little system to it, right? So could you there's explain a little bit of nuance to it? Yes. But, you know, the goal is to always just try to recreate the light that's getting in your eyes to be the same as the light that is outside. So. If the sun is not up in your environment, you should not have really bright light into your eyes at the time. So maybe first thing in the morning, if you're up before sunrise, maybe you are still wearing the red tinted glasses. The red ones make you look like the Terminator. (laughs) You know, (laughs) the the red ones block 100% of the blue light, 100% of the green light. But they're so effective for some people, they're going to make you super tired. So maybe you're not going to wear the red ones first thing in the morning. Maybe then you would switch to the yellow ones if you're not controlling your light environment at home. Now, if you've got the red light bulbs and you're not turning on a bunch of technology in the morning, you don't necessarily need to wear these glasses inside your own home. But first light, ideally, should be sunlight. 
into your eyes. You know, how much time? More is probably better, but you know, five, 10 minutes if you can get it would be a good starting point. Um, and then when you head back inside, it's when you're in front of the devices with technology that you got to be a little bit more mindful. You know, if you can control your environments like I do, there's you know, if this light's not on, I'm just getting natural light. Maybe I'm not necessarily going to wear these glasses the entire time I'm inside, unless I'm in front of this computer. So in front of the computer or the tablets, then, you know, you want some of that light information to hit the back of your eyes, but you don't want it to be the high intensity blue light 24 seven, because the light will tell your brain it's basically noontime. So the lens I'm currently wearing, they're a little bit more yellow. They're blocking somewhere 40 to 50% of the blue light. So some of the blue light is still getting through my lens, hitting the back of that blue light receptor in my eye. So my brain still knows it's daytime. It's just not dialed up at level 10 noontime light hitting my eyes. The sun will set in an hour or two where I'm at. And I generally will continue to wear these ones at home because my place is all lit up red at night. Yeah, or I'll take them off. But if I'm watching TV, I'll usually leave these ones on. But that hour before bed, that's really the key time. If you have the red lenses or the darker amber lenses, you switch to the darker lenses. So you're dialing down even less blue light because before light bulbs were invented, the only type of light you had at night was red light from a fire. So you're just trying to recreate that type of experience. But the red lenses for myself, if I put them on, I will be unconscious in less than 30 minutes. So I only generally will put them on when I really need to dial this in. But I kind of find it that the people who are more circadian and trained, they're seeing the morning sunrises and they're controlling the light. They typically don't necessarily need the red lenses that much to fall asleep. I mean, their just systems are dialed in. You know, if you're into sleep tracking with you know, your your rings or whoop bands or bio straps, cool. Yeah, you know, I have them all, tried them all. But once your sleep's dialed in, you don't probably really need to use them that much. Um, pro tip, always keep them in airplane mode. You don't want to get pinged with Bluetooth while you're sleeping with these things on. But you can play around with the dark lenses and see, well, how much more deep sleep do you get if you wear your dark lenses before bed, if you just wear your yellow lenses, or if you don't wear any lenses at all? How much is your heart rate variability changing? You'll probably see some of these metrics changing. So it's one of those test don't guess type of philosophies. Right. So that's so interesting. Yeah. For anyone who's feeling a little skeptical, yeah, test it out, throw on your aura ring, do all the different ways. You know, we can, I mean, it's amazing what we can test at home these days. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I wore an aura ring for a long time to get everything dialed in. And I was like, how does it know that? <laughs> Right. But yeah, it's great for for doing all these little hacks and really seeing the numbers that will actually will show you exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got our um, our sunlight dialed in. T talk a, a little bit to me about red light therapy and the connection between photobiomodulation and heart health, because I know that you practice. You have a lot of <laughs> you have a wall of red light <laughs> in your practice. Um, could you explain sort of what that is doing? Sure. So one of my favorite topics that, you know, educate patients on is photobiomodulation. So, you know, how do you use light therapy to change your biology? So photobiomodulation, for those that don't know, you know, it's photonic energy that the mitochondria are absorbing. For the nerds, it's the, you know, the four cytochromes absorbing those photons of light. It upregulates cytochrome C oxidase. And then basically more ATP is made in the mitochondria, which is one of the energy currencies. For the quantum health people, yes, I understand that there's probably some structured water thing happening as well, but the most you know, dialed in mechanism of action that they know about is that you know the fourth cytochrome, or say, yeah, cytochrome C oxidase is upregulated. You make more ATP. So since the heart is heavily dense in mitochondria, well, it stands to reason that if you could put more energy into the mitochondria in the heart, things may work better. Now, where does that actually come from? Well, there's studies done mostly in Russia. There's been studies in Israel that look at this. Yeah. The interesting thing is that it's not necessarily the light applied directly over where the heart is in your chest. It's more activating the stem cells that are in the sternum, the mesenchymal stem cells, or the stem cells that are in the tibia. It was a very fascinating kind of pilot trial that they did uh, a few years ago in Israel. There's patients coming into the hospital with ST elevation and MIs, which is kind of the acute emergency that you got to go straight to the cath lab. You know, otherwise patients are at high risk of dying. You know, they got angiograms to uh, uh, cohorts of patients. You know, they got the standard of care, but one of the groups also got photobiomodulation, and they 
did not treat it over the heart. They treated them over their legs with um, a laser that was skin contact. It was 810 nanometers, so it was more in the infrared wavelengths. And the time duration was less than two minutes. I don't remember if it was 90 seconds. I believe it you know, was. But they treated them like during the heart attack, a day later, and three days later. And they monitored for, you know, uh, you know, size of heart attack, you know, symptoms. Well, at nine months, the patients basically did exactly the same. But of note, the biomarkers were significantly different. The patients that got photobiomodulation had significantly lower levels of troponin, CKMB. These are markers that increase when the heart cells die and they release these proteins in the bloodstream. So they essentially had smaller heart attacks with being treated with photobiomodulation. Well, how is that possible? Well, the light therapy stimulated the stem cells. The stem cells went to the heart and supported the heart when it was without oxygen. And so they had smaller heart attacks because of this. So that kind of just, you know, put a bunch of alarm bells in my head when I first saw that uh, trial at a conference I was doing. I was like, oh, this is fascinating. Like, because most photomodulation research is mainly in the musculoskeletal world, you know, people injure the shoulders, knees, and this is one way to kind of get things, you know, back on track is using these panels. You know, a lot of the pro sport teams use them. But my mind always works as kind of biohacker, like how could this work for a cardiovascular patient? Well, if you activate stem cells in the sternum, they're going to go help where things are broken. You know, I play around with a device right now, you know, it's kind of flashing, but I have multiple of these like little, you know, photobiomodulation devices that, you know, go on your wrist. You know, you got an artery, your radio artery, ulnar mm -hmm. artery, and it's put in photonic energy directly into your bloodstream. And then the red blood cells absorb this light, like little ferry boats and take the light energy to where things are needed. So these can help somewhat lower blood pressure. So I'm playing around with this with some of my patients that come in, their blood pressure is elevated, put these devices on them for 30 minutes while they're chatting with us, and then we recheck them. Yes, of course, sometimes just waiting helps, but we've also seen people lower the blood pressure 30, 40 points, you know, using these type of technologies. So is it going to be the standard care in the future that if you have high blood pressure, you should have a light therapy? Maybe. Yeah, you know, I think there's always a root cause why the blood pressure is elevated in the first place, but it can be augmented. You know, maybe they don't need as many blood pressure medications. You could potentially use light therapy to help release nitric oxide and lower blood pressure. Wow, that's so interesting. So that little device is on your wrist because of the artery. Correct. You got to have skin okay. contact to be able to get the light in the, into the system. Okay. And then I've also seen pictures of the wall in, yeah, yeah. in your yeah. office that is basically a red light panel across most of the entire wall. So yeah. tell me how you use that and why you why you have such a big light, what the benefit is to that. So I have a eight foot tall, four foot wide panel in my office. Um, I use it as a demonstration device for my patients because when they stand in front of that thing, they're going to notice, you know, how they feel afterwards. It's not the heat that you're getting the benefit from. It's the red penetrating the mitochondria. And so I want people to have a good experience with one because that is one of the biggest challenges with this red light therapy is getting a high quality device. Because if you just go on to Google and, you know, or Amazon buy something that's cheap, well, Maybe it doesn't work for you. And then you just kind of dismiss it like, yeah, this red light therapy doesn't really work. Well, it's a couple of things. You have to have the right color, the right wavelength of light. You got to have the right irradiance or power density. So how many photons of light is coming out of the device? Is it like a little trinkle or is it like a fire hose? You know, and then how long do you use the thing for? That's kind of the kind of the magic. You know, that's the recipe. You know, if you just turn the light on and walk away, no benefit. You stay in front of the light for 10 hours, you're probably gonna not injure yourself. But you basically overcharge the circuit and you lose the benefit. It's the biphasic response. There's a Goldilocks zone that you get the benefit from. So I use this panel to kind of teach people, this is what you should feel like. These are the type of the parameters you want to look for if you're going to get a device to use at home. And it's also just a cool marketing device. Like when I turn that light on, it literally blasts out a mile or two down the street. So we have pictures of the building <laughs> I'm in lit up red at night. So it's, you know, it's just a cool uh, marketing toy. <laughs> that's fantastic so what would what is the general goldilocks zone for using a red light there panel so say i go and i buy i go to your website and i see some brands that you recommend and i buy a high quality one 
what do I do with it? That's a great point. Is that like, you know, it's, you know, you want to spot well, that's how I call it, like anything that hurts. You want to shine the light directly on what hurts. But, you know, anything that plugs into the wall, there's more risk that there's going to be more, you know, radiation, more non-native EMF coming from the device. Often it's the fans uh, that keeps the devices from overheating if it comes with fans. So it's somewhat of a made up number that you should automatically be six inches away from these devices, but that's usually what most of the manufacturers will recommend. So you want to follow what the manufacturers put on their devices. But, you know, if you have a device that's battery powered, it's DC powered, then the, the EMFs are basically negligent. They're zero, um, negligible, I should say. And so, you know, then you can do direct skin contact with those type of devices. And that's how photobiomodulation really is optimal is that you're getting direct skin contact because you know the light you know that penetrates you know it basically has to get in through the skin if you're further from the device a lot of that light is bouncing right off your skin so i haven't turned on the, the red light that i normally have in my office because otherwise my face would just be lit up red mm -hmm. right now but you know over 60 percent of the light that's you know hitting your skin that's red just bounces off you have to get the light to absorb and with skin contact, you get the light to absorb better. So if you have a, you know, decently powered device and it does not need to be hundred milliwatts per centimeter square, that's kind of some also internet myth that it has to be high powered to get the benefit. You know, it's probably 20 milliwatts per centimeter squared is probably a decently powerful enough device to get the response that you want. But the real key is the time that you're going to do for that. And so this is where it gets tricky is that it really depends on what you're trying to treat. You know, if it's, you know, a musculoskeletal injury, there's a different recipe than if you're treating stem cells. If you're treating just beauty, you know, I want better skin. Like, okay, it's probably less time. So that's really the trick. You know, the rough estimate though is like most sessions are probably not going to be more than 10 or 15 minutes long. You do not need to do an hour in front of the scene to get the benefits. Okay. And would you do you recommend this to your patients? Um, do you recommend photobiomodulation as a preventative practice? Do you recommend it with the sun or instead of the sun or during the winter if you can't get sun? Yeah, that's a great point. Is that you know, I, I frequently joke that it's a sun supplement, you know, much like there are supplements. <laughs> if we were like, should I take this fish oil capsule? I'm like, you can, but should you? You know, you should be eating this stuff. And should you be using red light panels? You should be using the sun. It augments the sunlight. Now, yes, there's times in the wintertime that maybe you're not going to have much access to the healing red and infrared light outside as much, but it's still never a replacement for the sun because, you know, there's other frequencies of light. You know, there's the blue light that you need from the sun to set your circadian rhythms, and you're not going to get them from these panels. So I teach my patients about them. But I don't necessarily have a you know fixed protocol that, hey, every one of my patients has to use one of these things. If patients are interested in it, then I teach them how to, to best utilize them. Right. And so going back to your practice as a quantum cardiologist, um, board certified and all the all the regular stuff, what do you look for um, that a traditional cardiologist does not? Uh, cause I assume people come to you as you, since you're preventative, people probably come to you who for some reason may have a concern due to family history or whatever, and they want to get out in front of it. So what type, what types of tests do you run? What do you ask people? What do you look for? Um, that's different from what you would get it if you just sort of went to the, whoever's covered by your insurance at the local hospital. Sure. Because the, the greatest majority of people don't meet the cardiologist, you know, until they're having their heart attack. You know, they're being wheeled on the journey <laughs> to the cath lab and they're like, we're going to go in there, we're going to fix things for you. And you're like, all right. And you're just at the luck of the draw who's, you know, going to be there. And, you know, I shouldn't, you know, make you scared of that. You know, well, anybody who's, you know, well trained in a, you know, cardiovascular yeah. program and done thousands of casts, yeah. you're going to get a good outcome likely. But the challenge really is, is doing the deep dive. Why did you end up in that cath lab in the first place? And that's not where they're always trained in. They're in there to like save your life. They're not in there to tell you like, oh, it's you have elevated LPLA, which one in five people has, and this is why you develop plaque 20 years before your colleagues did. You know, there's different biomarkers that you can assess on these 
blood work panels and they're not necessarily that expensive or that you know difficult to obtain you know quest which is a nationwide lab you know they acquired cleveland heart lab a few years ago cleveland heart lab has excellent you know biomarkers that look at cardiovascular risk factors you know there's nearly 400 risk factors that you know can cause plaque in the arteries and so everybody's kind of hyper focused on that it's always cholesterol 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 now cholesterol is always going to be present in plaques but if you don't dive deeper you don't understand that like it's not about the cholesterol it's about the lipoproteins that vary the cholesterol through the bloodstream and so you have to do the advanced biomarkers and looking at particle count and apoB particles that really tells you are you at higher risk from a quote cholesterol issue because a lot of times patients tell you have high cholesterol here's your medicine to lower it that's a little bit too simplistic you got to know is it actually doing any damage to your arteries do you have endothelial dysfunction because it really starts with endothelial dysfunction. That's something that I did not necessarily think about much in my conventional training was that you know, we took care of people once the plaques ruptured, but we didn't really think much about like, well, what could we do if the arteries are just a little bit inflamed? How could we put the fire on the arteries before the plaques develop? And there's different blood tests and there's different novel devices I have in the office that can test your arteries. Well, how elastic are they? How much nitric oxide can their arteries release? You know, there's imaging that you can do of your artery on the carotid artery, like, how much inflammation's in the artery? There's non-invasive tests that look at calcifications in your artery or soft plaque in your arteries. You want to find stuff before the people have symptoms. In conventional cardiology, often it's symptoms-based things that bring people to the doctor. You show up to the doctor because you're having chest pain or your chest is sore when you exercise or you're short of breath or, man, I go up these couple of flights of stairs and I can't do it anymore. I am completely winded. Well, then they're going to do a stress test on you and you, quote, fail the stress test. Well, that leads you to the cath lab and, you know, they potentially stint you or send you off for bypass surgery. But just because you don't have symptoms does not mean you're not at high risk because nearly half the people that have heart attacks have no symptoms before they do because they have more minor blockages in their arteries. It's these minor blockages that basically rupture like a pimple on the artery wall, the blood clots, and then the person has a heart attack and they didn't know that they were at high risk. So I just did more research, you know, figured out who was really good at finding these types of plaques and then learned from them and then figured out what types of technology that I could acquire in my practice. Or if I don't have access to it, who has access to it? And then just get patients screened, you know, 10 years before they're going to have their first heart attack. It's a lot easier to prevent things from happening when you look much earlier. Yeah, that's amazing. So when you talk about the endothelial dysfunction, could you explain that a little bit more and sort of help us to understand um, why why we might have that? Sure. So the you know the inner lining of your arteries has a coating called the endothelium. Your endothelium is one cell thick, and if you're able to kind of stretch out all your endothelium in your blood vessels, it would be approximately the surface area of six tennis courts. So it's one of your largest organs, if not the largest, especially the largest one you don't know that you have. Um, but lining the endothelium, some also called the endothelial glycocalyx, which is a protective gel coating for the endothelium. It's essentially a sensor for what's floating in the bloodstream. So high blood pressure, high blood sugar, infections, smoking, many, many things damages protective gel coating and if the gel coating gets damaged, then the endothelium gets damaged. If the endothelium gets damaged, the body makes less nitric oxide. If the arteries make less nitric oxide, then the lipoproteins, which are floating through your bloodstream, trying to transport triglycerides to your muscles to use for energy, they stick to the artery wall. The white blood cells stick to the artery wall. And then they make it retained underneath that endothelium. And then that causes inflammation in the artery wall. The body basically thinks bacteria is attacking it. And then that's the nidus for the plaques to start building up. So the cholesterol was some of the innocent bystander initially, which is investigating like, what's going on? Why is the artery, you know, scratched up? What's going here? I'm going to try to repair this. And it gets trapped in there. And it essentially starts dropping its cargo off in the artery wall. So cholesterol is not put into you to give you heart attacks. It's there as a building block for your vitamin D, your sex hormones, your cell membranes, your bias. And so without cholesterol, you're not alive. But because cholesterol is waxy, it's not going to float in your liquid blood by itself. The liver makes these lipoproteins to transport them around. But it's when these lipoproteins stick to the endothelium, that's the first sign 
that the arteries are getting damaged. And you can see this happening in people in their teens and 20s. So if you inter hmm. intervene when they start having just early signs of endothelial dysfunction, you can stop the entire process of plaque formation. And if somebody already has plaque in their arteries, it's not too late, you can recover endothelial function. But if you don't, the plaques will just continue to roll and you'll continue to grow them. And, you know, it's kind of like whack-a-mole. You'll develop a new plaque somewhere else and you'll get a new stent and a new artery. And, you know, you just never fully put the fire out in the arteries is the, the other way to kind of think about it. Hmm. And getting good quality sleep helps with all of this. It, it's the number one thing, you know, seeing the sunrise every day and prioritizing your sleep is probably the closely second related uh, tip that I tell patients. And what does earlier early endothelial dysfunction look like? What would be a sign of that? It's a great question. So, you know, there can be many things that show up as that. So, you know, having elevated blood pressure greater than 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. You know, for guys, if you have erectile performance issues, ED, that is often a sign that you have endothelial dysfunction. I often say ED equals ED, because if you can't get blood flow to the penis, then it's often that you have issues with the endothelium to your heart arteries, your carotid arteries, your brain arteries. So that's kind of the canary in the coal mine. But people with rain you know, where their hands get really white, cold in the winter, mm -hmm. that's a microcirculation issue. Um, so those are kind of the, the bigger ones that typically would notice without testing. But then it's more kind of different biomarkers that you can assess. Asymmetric dimethyl arginine, um, <laughs> uric acid, homocysteine. And then the one that's kind of cheap and easy is just a urine microalbumin creatinine. You know, that's something that, you know, even conventional doctors check in anybody who has high blood pressure, or, you know, risk factor for diabetes, because if you're leaking protein into your urine, you essentially have endothelial dysfunction to your kidneys. If you have endothelial mm -hmm. dysfunction there, you probably have it elsewhere. So start looking for other causes for things. This is so interesting. I was telling the story just the other day of the father of a friend of mine who was a very fit guy. He was always the life of the party. He was up running mile, three miles every morning, his whole life. And he dropped out of a heart attack playing tennis at 68. And I was telling this story to a friend and they said, oh, well, there, were there any signs? <laughs> and I said, no, but it's interesting that, you know, if you look at this, at the level that you're talking about, you're saying the signs are there very early could even be like starting in your twenties. Yeah. The, you know, a lot of times these are asymptomatic types of things that you're seeing, but it's just the way that the arteries are responding to the inputs. Um, and it's where, you know, that is always kind of like my mission is like just educating people. Like there's another way to look at things because that is the biggest kind of fallacy that just because you look fit on the outside, just because you eat a healthy Mediterranean diet, that everything is perfectly going okay with the 60,000 miles of blood vessels on the inside. I often tell the story on other shows, you know, about Bob Harper, the gentleman from the biggest loser show on TV, very fit individual, but at the age of, I believe he was 52, he had a massive, almost life ending heart attack in the gym. And if it wasn't for a medical student who was working on the same gym and helped resuscitate him, he wouldn't have made it. You know, he made it to the cath lab. They stented his left interior descending artery. Two days later, he wakes up in the ICU and is like, what happened? They're like, you had a massive heart attack and almost died. On the deep cause analysis, they found out he had elevated lipoprotein little a, which one in five people may have. It's the number one genetically inherited lipoprotein that increases the risk of early cardiovascular disease. LPA can damage the glycocalyx, which increases the risk that the plaques are going to start building up earlier than 67 years old. So you could find this on a simple blood test. It costs less than twenty dollars to know if you have high levels of this lipoprotein. Yeah, you know, I don't know if he had any of this type of testing before he had his heart attack, but this is my speculation: is that if he would have had some of this imaging testing or looking at anything health, it probably wouldn't have been completely normal. And then they could be like, "Why is this not possible? Like you're very fit. Well, what are you missing? Again, there's four hundred things that can cause black in your arteries. You have to look a little bit deeper. Right. And so, but likely what people are missing that would help would be sunlight and good sleep. Oh yeah, St start with the basics. Yeah, yeah, a lot of these <laughs> fancy labs and testing, yeah, it just kind of helps kind of really fine tune things. But the, the recipe for like optimizing things 
is very, very general. Like almost everybody gets the same recipe. It's like, see every sunrise, optimize your sleep, eat during daylight hours, get a high quality protein to fuel your muscles. Don't be sedentary, manage your stress. I mean, they are basic things that do not cost money. It's just scheduling yourself to get these things done during the daylight hours. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's, there's this idea and, you know, I'm just thinking now of all the people I know who we've lost to heart disease. Um, yeah. And a lot of them were very health conscious, but also quite hard charging, right? Like, I think there's this idea that a lot of men and probably, and women too, I don't know. I, I only know men who died of heart attacks actually anecdotally, you could t- explain to me the difference, but, um, yeah, there's this idea that I'm going to work really hard and I'm going to do really hard and I'm going to eat really well and I'm going to exercise really hard. But if we're, if we don't look at the other piece of that, the sleep, the rest, the recovery, the, uh, stress management, which would be having periods of time where you are not under pressure in any capacity, <laughs> these are all just as important if, well, absolutely. or more, more so. Absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, you know, the uh, woman man difference is that, you know, heart disease tends to strike women about 10 years later than men because estrogen mm-hmm. is cardioprotective. But okay. that's something that I didn't mention earlier. But like the number one thing that still takes women out before their time is due is still cardiovascular disease. Oh. Multiples of, you know, times, I think it's eight times more than, you know, breast cancer. And, you know, not saying people shouldn't be concerned about, you know, breast cancer risk, but you're so much more likely that cardiovascular disease is going to take you out. So, you know, it starts with endothelial dysfunction. So everybody has to mind their endothelium. Right. And so whether you're, we're stressing ourselves out and losing sleep by working too hard or just doing too much in general, uh, I think a really important takeaway for everyone today is, is this, that sleep was really going to help. And to, in order to sleep well, we need to get our light right. Hundred percent, yes. Okay. Uh, any last words that you have for us today, Doctor Twyman? Well, just want to thank everybody for the opportunity to kind of share this message. You know, I have nothing to sell you right now. It's just, <laughs> you know, education. You know, I've learned these things from many mentors, and I feel it's my obligation to give this information back to people. You know, your health is in your own hands. Or you are your own doctor. Yeah, I can always be here to help guide you and tell you like these are the better tests to consider, but the basics are the basics see every sunrise, you know, mind your mitochondria, get your sleep, do those things. And you're so much less likely to see my cardiovascular colleagues in the hospital. (laughs) Amen. May that be the future for everybody to never have to meet your colleagues. Yes. (laughs) And to come and see you in St. Louis if they want to get a workup. (laughs) Be happy to. Yes. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time. This has been the Quantum Biology Collective Podcast. To find a practitioner who practices from this point of view, visit our directory at quantumbiologycollective.org. If you are a practitioner, definitely take a look at the Applied Quantum Biology Certification, a six-week study of the science of the new human health paradigm and its practical application with your patients and clients. We also love to feature graduates of the program on this very podcast. Until next time, the QBC.